Well, as you know, uh, Germany is running at a major surplus, about $18 billion surplus in the budget. Um, and it's become a real problem. We've been talking, of course, about all the different countries that, have, that are facing the opposite and that they have to come up with budget policy, fiscal policy, in order to get their house in order. In Germany, we have the contrary. Of course, now, uh, if you look at, now talking specifically about Germany, uh, cars, you picked here a, an area which has been of, of most uh, interesting or most interested uh, uh, investments. Uh, there were a lot of changes in regulations regarding European cars, and uh, that triggered a number of changes in lines of cars for different and older Europeans, mainly I'm talking, you spoke about Volkswagen, but it's true also for some French cars, Peugeot and Renault Absolutely. that have been doing well. Now, uh, it's, it's, you know, competition is there. I mean, the dollar euro has been so weak, and, and this is the purpose of it. You have to have some positive returns on, this, on, on the program that, uh, of, of, of uh, I'm, I'm sorry, on the exports of, of the cars. Uh, whether it's you know price in dollar, of course, does make it very you know attractive. attractive. Uh, and is it going to go on until again? There's a lag here between the impact in the market as opposed to when the rate changes. Currencies, when you change, when you have euro dollar change from 105 to 110, uh, it it is enormous when you're talking about portfolio and investments. But when we talk about real economy. There's not much impact. Now, uh, uh, we all want to sort of like know which, which way, which, where this rate is going. And we mentioned that there's like a range between 104 and 115. We might be going down to one. The saying in the say we might be going down to one. But uh, let's, let's speak about the Federal Reserve again. The Federal Reserve, and this is new, the Federal Reserve is very concerned about a strong dollar. The Federal Reserve does not want to have a dollar too strong. And, and I believe that one dollar for one euro is too strong, and it is probably not what they want, and they will not let it go that way. The Treasury and the Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, are not as transparent regarding currencies as the European banks are. Uh, such as whether it was Switzerland or the European Central Bank. Difficult to put a percentage, but I believe the perception... Um, we went from 140 to, let's say, par parity, just about. So there is... There, there is, is, absolutely. Absolutely. I would, not I would say like 20%. 20%. real value. No, no. Is this sustainable? No. It no, is not, not sustainable. It is not. But but the foreign exchange uh, is, is, a is a constant pendulum. The pendulum goes way goes up to the forth, extreme, yeah. back and forth. It will never, it's just about never steady. The only currency that sort of keeps steady is the yen, because it's very much under control of the Bank of Japan. But the rest is like a pendulum. And the pendulum going to near parity for the, for the dollar is, is not acceptable for the reserve. The easy answer, of course, is no. Um, they are already facing a major problem with the Greece, for example. Um, there are lots of different thoughts, a school of thoughts, on how to, to deal with the different uh, fiscal policies and structure policy that each country has to input, or to, input to, uh, to apply in order to be able to fit in the overall Eurozone frame. But it's, it is not doable. You know, basically, as we said earlier, is you cannot have Iran economically a zone such a, such as big as this one, where you have different... Central uh, banks and... Exactly. And yeah. different fiscal policy and different budget policy. It's not doable. It's not doable. Russia... Politics of Russia is very important here, and uh, it is being put into shade because we have we don't, we're dealing with Greece, we've been dealing with UK, but the politics aspect is very important. 
uh, I, I just want to quote actually the, the, uh, something that said uh, both at the same time a few weeks ago, Mr. Kissinger recently, a few weeks ago, at the same time Mr. Gorbachev, he was, they were speaking of course of the uh, possible invasion of Ukraine, of the taking over of Crimea, and they both said this is going, this could lead to a real first time confrontation since World War II. Now, of course, on the, uh, on, in front of them, in front of, of Russia, you have Mr. Obama, who has shown here and there some weaknesses. Uh, and we know that Mr. Putin is very determined. So, Mr. Putin moves his, his makes his move, let's say, in a very subtle, subtle way. Um, there was one comment actually saying here that Greece has to stay in the Eurozone because otherwise you're going to have interest by countries such as Russia who are looking at Greece again, help them having some sort of strategic, which is probably not very real, but strategic uh, geographical uh, uh, country to have somewhere down uh, the Mediterranean. So again, we're talking very much about politics, but the impact of what Russia does, of course, it is extremely important, extremely important. The, um, the link between, uh, between China and the US is, is a love-hate relationship. They need one another. Out of the 17 or 18 trillion of, of debt, 40% uh, of it is Japan and China. It's of course very important. Now, they, they cannot, and we're talking a lot about currency war behind, behind doors uh, that is led against the US. The same thing, you know, you know that China has just put together a new um, a, a, new, a sort of new development bank at which the U.S. has refused to, to join uh, at first, and now they're a bit embarrassed because they would like to be part of it. Um, it, it is very political, it is very uh, strategical, um, but they are still very much interlinked. They both need one, one another. Um, and I don't see, at the moment, I don't see a major shift in foreign exchange rates, which could change this, this Cold War balance, let's put it that way, between the two countries. We have here a, a, a fantastic opportunity because we are talking about, again, first a technical drop in, your, in bonds, and when bonds go down, rates go up, in, the, in bond markets, equities cannot really perform well. That was a good uh, trigger to take profits in European stocks. That's one aspect. The second aspect is we have this uncertainty by Greece that is also helping, well, helping is not the right word, but anyway, helping keeping the stock market under control here and rather on the weak side. Greece has no impact, or almost no impact, financially on Europe, on the Eurozone. Everything is, again, once again, is political. It's much more about, of course, it's got a huge financial uh, impact for Greece itself, of course, but for the Eurozone, not. Now, um, it, is, it is going to be very difficult. The way we see here, probably would happen, we're talking about deadlines. It is in no one's interest to have Greece go out. If Greece goes out of the, of the Eurozone, they'll, they'll and, and issue again their currency, the drachma, it'll be a major devaluation, there'll be bankruptcies, they'll be run on the banks and so forth. Of course, at the end, they can have their own policy and things will get cheap and maybe it'll pick up, but we're talking about a huge price, probably, most probably much bigger than the price they have to pay if they stay in. Now, um, 
they have to, again, Greece, now we're talking about free deadlines and they have to have compromise. It seems like, from what we read, in, to, to say it in one word, we're back to reducing the pension benefits to Greek, uh, Greek people, to Greek population. And, uh, it, uh, and this is where, in fact, we can see where if one's going to give up or not. It, it is a big uncertainty here, and that's when going back to the market. It's a huge uncertainty, and the markets don't like uncertainty, of the political and strategical effect of a possible exit of Greece on the rest of Europe that is causing the market to be so weak. So weak, I mean, to be weaker than they were. Uh, it is an unknown. The market does not like unknown. And the unknown creates opportunities. And these opportunities here, no matter what happens, Greece will go by and will have, will, will, will going to be again, will go by and that with the problem will go by. We might have to live with it. I don't think they're going to come with something, you know, like yes or no, black or white, for, you know, the in the next few days until the end of June and solve the problem and say, you know, it's going to be ongoing. Now, let's, you know, we have to keep in mind, you know, we say Greece is like being a bit unreasonable, but that the, the austerity programs has reduced Greece's economy by a quarter since they started for six years ago. Now, it has not worked with Greece, with Greece it has worked very well with Ireland. Spain. It's, we're fantastic with Spain. Spain, fantastic. Turn around was magnificent. Yeah. Spain is growing at 2.7 percent. It's the, the one of the strongest. I think it's the growth, strongest country here today. By far, yeah. Um, it's it's uh, an island, even Cyprus. So if you have Greece go out, then you're going to have those countries who are going to go back and say, "We're not going to keep with this austerity plans. We want to, you know, we want to have the same sort of deal." Um, so. Uh, it is difficult, and, uh, but the, everybody has to lose. Everybody has to lose if Greece goes out. So it's probably going to go on. They're going to kick the can down, as they say, as an American expression, down the road and see it pick it up sooner or later. They're going give to give, somebody's going to give in. Of course, now there's a big pressure for, for, um, uh, for Tsipras to, to give in. Um, he might call for election. There are two ways to call for an election. One is to get a referendum, referendum um, and, and, and try to see whether they want to stay in the Euro or not, and then if the population wants to stay in the Eurozone. Or the other way is, you know, whether they agree with the policy of reducing. So there are two ways to look at it. But at the end of the day, it is for sure that three-quarters of the population wants to stay in the, in the Eurozone and stay with the Euro. And even his backers that uh, put him in place, you know, politically, uh, they, they do feel now the pressure of not going too much against the grain because it, it's going to be very harmful for, the, for Greece, for the country. You know, when, when the debt was at uh, 8 trillion, that's when Obama came, uh, came in, everybody said it's huge, it's, it's, it's enormous, we have to do something about it. We, uh, he was the first, Mr. Obama said himself, we have to do something about it. And yet, now, six years later, we are at 17, 18 billion and still running. Like one of the, our economists, uh, with whom we, we work very closely, he said, you know, debt is here to stay and debt is here to deal with and we're going to have to learn to, to, to deal with it because nobody is going to pay back. When is the last time really you had a reduction of debt by a country? I don't think that, I cannot remember of any case. It's only keep on growing. But uh, what it's one condition is that you are able to refinance it. And America can do that. So. America can do it, of course, uh, with the help of China and Japan, um, mainly, but they still be able to do it. The Federal Reserve has not historically dealt with the dollar as a tool for monetary policy. They have been speaking about it. Uh, Mrs. Yellen has been speaking about it. Mr. Stanley Fisher, the Vice Chairman, has been speaking about it. So it is a very strong element. So I do not believe that the dollar, the euro dollar rate will be under one, um, at least not on a sustainable level. So the, the 
I would say here, you know, we, 115 is, is the upper, upper range. Uh, we're going to see first a stronger dollar from, from 112, where we are today, 112 and a half. Probably go down near parity, maybe a bit slow, but not on the long term, medium to long term level. We're not going to see that. We're probably going to go back up. I'm happy to join in. Good evening, everybody, and, and thank you for having us here at uh, Citra Capital's event. Uh, just to come back on the, uh, the question of how you can benefit from a lower euro, obviously, by European stocks, um, you know, that, that's the, the obvious answer. Uh, the uh, European export industries, as Bob mentioned, are benefiting from a, a lower euro. They, are, have, they, they have very good and very strong profit margins. And as Hani uh, uh, implied in this question, is the current turmoil in the markets or the current drop in the markets a buying opportunity? Uh, and Bob answered, yes, it is a buying opportunity. But it's not a, 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 a unique buying opportunity. There are going to be more buying opportunities in the European markets in the months and, the, and, and probably years ahead. Because if you think back to what Bob presented earlier, the quantitative easing program is going to go on for years. And uh, we know from the American experience that that money flows into uh, the equity markets. So, uh, and uh, when you have a combination of strong profit margins, a low currency, and a quantitative easing program that's pumping money into the markets, then you have a, as close as you get to a winning formula. So therefore, we are very bullish on European equities in the long run. There are going to be moves up and down. The markets uh, don't move in one single direction. But clearly, there are going to be very good returns to be had by carefully selecting those industries that are going to be uh, uh, benefiting from this set of uh, factors. And those industries are the export industries. Um, and they're also the, um, the, sorry, my colleague is whispering something to me, which I can't hear. Choosing the right themes, absolutely. Choose the right uh, stocks uh, in the right industries. Uh, which will benefit. And, and again, export industries very, very clearly. But there's also domestic consumption uh, picking up in the euro uh, area. It's the Greek situation is dominating the picture right now. But actually, if you do away with the noise, the picture in the uh, European Union is actually a pretty strong one. And um, the European finances are actually pretty strong. And they can easily if they wanted to, if they had the political will, they could easily afford to bail out Greece. It wouldn't be a problem for Germany and, and, and the other countries in the European Union to put a little bit of money uh, down south and, and buy out the Greek debt. They can easily do it, but of course the domestic taxpayers are not going to let them. And that's why we have this Greek drama going on. We take uh, industrial production in the US and in Europe. In 2009, you're, let's say that Europe and the US were at 100. We went down the crisis to 75 as an index for both, 75 to 80. Today, in the, the index of industrial production is at 105 in the US, and we're still at 90 in Europe. There's a lot of catching up to do for Europe versus the US regarding quantitative easing, but also the whole state of the economy. There's a lot of catching up to do. And another uh, uh, point uh, which is important mentioning is that we are starting now to see an increase in credits by the European banks. It was very difficult to get that going, and it's finally getting started. But European banks versus U.S. banks have about a three to four year lag in the economic cycle into getting this new liquidity given by the central bank and passing it on to the economy. So this is starting, this is all. So we have to a little bit put aside you know, the current problems, we were, which were a great opportunity to take profits and look at the medium and longer term 
short-term rates, I mean, they're not short-term, but the rates are, are going to be low for a while, for quite a while. Even if we have quantitative easing, that might be sort of like maybe uh, at some point uh, we might say, oh, maybe they're going to stop, but they, you know, they'll pick it up again, whatever. But in the long run, rates, short-term rates are going to be low. Corporations will be able to borrow cheaply, and this is going to continue for a while. And this is the element, the most important element for stock market, a low interest rate environment. First, congratulations to Saudi Arabia for opening, for opening up uh, the stock market. Um, our main concern for our client is liquidity. And we have, if, if a stock market offers the proper liquidity, whereby we can foresee the time frame in which we can liquidate our investment, this is the most important thing for us to invest. And that is going to be the criteria, as we have to see now historically down the, down the road, uh, how uh, widely spread interest is in the, in the uh, Saudi Arabian market, and, uh, and that will obviously trigger, I don't think we can, we can compare, of course, you know, we're talking about emerging market, but it's more, it, it is not a country that has a, a uh, economical problems such, uh, like other emerging countries. Uh, it is very specific in terms of wealth and, and, and well-being, and uh, we'll have to see if liquidity and the amount of volume and interest that will get there.